welcome everybody to our Breaking It Down series on intent data, um, what it is and how you should use it. My name is Dennis Oljai. I'm Vice President of Product Marketing at Dun & Bradstreet, and I'm joined today by Mike Burton at Bombora. Mike, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Dennis. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike Burton. I'm a co-founder at Bombora. Um, and so, yeah, I've been, been at Bombora since the beginning and excited to talk to you all about uh, intent data. So I think our first question most of our audience is worrying about or wondering about, I should say, is the basic one, right? What is intent data? And um, I like to use analogies when I'm trying to describe something in simplest terms, right? And one that I like to use a lot is um, imagine you have a store in a mall, right? And the people that are walking into your store, they have potentially a problem. Uh, they're potentially interested in something, right? Um, but they haven't really purchased anything yet, right? They're doing their research, right? Same thing happens in the online world, right? When you're going onto Google, you're browsing publisher websites, you're looking for answers to a problem, right? So people that are walking into your store in the mall, that's first party intent, right? It's your owned property. That could be your website, right? People coming to your website, they're demonstrating some sort of interest in your solution. So that's first party intent. Third party intent is people that are in the mall, right? They haven't really entered your, your store yet, right? They're, they're browsing, they're out there. Uh, this could be people that are on maybe CNN.com or TechCrunch or, you know, the Washington Post. They're also displaying some interest, right? Um, they're interested in potentially software or services. Um, and that's what we call third party intent data, right? So that intent signal is transferred back for marketers and sellers to be able to target people uh, that are actively engaged in the buying cycle. So I love using that analogy because it's simple, uh, but that's sort of how I think about it. How do you think about it? Mike? Yeah. No, I love that. I hadn't heard that one before. Um, and I, I like it a lot and mostly because it, it frames really well. Um, well, think about all the people that aren't at the mall at all, <laughs> because one way to look at it is, well, if they're, if they're not in my store and they're just at the mall, well, what does that mean? They could be interested in anything. But it's like, well, imagine all the people that just aren't at the mall. They didn't come to the mall at all. You can definitely not sell them anything. And I think that's a good way to think about the power of intent data and even start to think about how to implement it at scale, right? Because it's, that's what it's about. It's about higher percentage shots. It's about across your sales and marketing motions, having a much, much better opportunity to engage with a given account um, based around the fact that they're showing statistical signs that the vast majority of their of, of an addressable market is not. And I think the mall analogy does that well, right? Like you you are not going to sell to anyone who doesn't enter the mall today. It's impossible. Right. And so just like in B2B, it's like, hey, if there, there are companies out there that are showing, you know, re relevant research behavior across these other publishers that might not be your site. It's like, yeah, they're in the mall. They're at least in the ballpark of, of showing the right interest and, and putting your sales and marketing towards those folks you're going to have a lot more success. Exactly, right? And I think, you know, you bring up a good point about, you know, higher chance shots, right? And, uh, you know, you certainly care more about or have a higher likelihood of succeeding uh, in talking to or engaging with people that are on your digital properties, whether it's your website or people actively engaged in the buying cycle, right? It doesn't replace anything else that you traditionally do, right? It doesn't replace your ideal customer profile, whether it's the size, the location, the industry, right? All those things help too, uh, but the intent data definitely is an important tactic that everyone should be using that gives you that additional layer of intelligence that's gonna make your teams more productive. It's gonna make sure that you're spending your resources, whether it's time or money effectively. And ultimately our goal as sell and selling and marketing teams is to grow pipeline and revenue, right? And all those things are working in our favor if we're using intent data correctly. Yeah, hundred percent. So what our data tells us is that 15 to 20 percent of any addressable market is showing some increase in interest in a product or service, right? And that could be a lot of interest, like they are, you know, consuming all kinds of different content and clearly very interested versus just a small statistical uplift in interest. But either way, there's only 15 or 20 percent. And so the power is being able to you know, not ignore, but put a lot less stress on the other 80%, 80 to 85% that are just, you know, most likely not in market right now. Absolutely, Mike. I couldn't have said it better myself. So that wraps up our first part of our Breaking It Down series on intent data. And next we'll talk about use cases of intent and how you can use it in your sales and marketing efforts. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you.